it's time for us to check back in with Louisa and Mountain Path and see what happens next. If you've missed any of the previous readings, you can look in the description below for a link to the playlist. No child in Cow Valley had ever seen a Christmas tree or knew a Christmas song. A few of the more enlightened families, such as the cows, let their children hang up stockings and these would be filled with hard candy and choice homegrown apples saved for the event. Christmas in the valley had never been a day of great importance. In most homes, Christmas dinner was like any other dinner, and if one celebrated at all, it would be the men, who by drinking more than common and firing long salutes from their shotguns and pistols, made the time a terror for the women folk and the more timid of the children. This year, however, Louisa saw to it that Christmas began to be talked about in school not long after Halloween. She wanted to give the children and herself, too, something to think upon instead of the other end and what might happen to Chris. Every day, the school practiced songs and learned poems about Christmas, and gradually it came to be noised about that teacher was going to have a Christmas program, though program was much too dignified a term for what she had in mind. She had never really enjoyed Christmas time herself, but this year, because she had so little to spend and so many gifts to give that really mattered, she began early to give a good deal of time and thought to the matter. She decided to send her relatives in Lexington a box of holly and mistletoe and spoke of the matter to Corey. Corey said that she would like to give them something too. Louisa thought no more about it until one afternoon when she returned from school, Corey proudly displayed her gift that she was then packing in a fruit jar box. The box contained a quart of jar of molasses, another one of unstrained honey mixed with comb and unhatched bees, a goodly amount of fodder beans, and a near peck of sun-dried apples. She could not help but picture to herself the reception Corey's miscellany of gifts would receive. However, much to her surprise, a week or so after sending the present, Corey received a letter from Mrs. Sheridan together with a quilted silk dressing gown. The dressing gown was one given to the sender a number of years before and never worn because of an unsuitability in both coloring and size. Corey knew nothing of the antecedents of the gown and was childly pleased but greatly cast down when she learned from teacher that such a garment was not suitable for dazzling the eye of one's neighbor in church. As usual with Corey, she was not long in low spirits. She was soon deep in plans for a music party in her own home to which all the lower end would be invited and she could wear the gown. The woman's deep appreciation of the useless gift irked Louisa. It did not seem fair. Corey had given wholeheartedly of things she could use and might at some time need. Her aunt had reciprocated the homely gift with a fine appearing thing given only because the giver had no need of it. She herself determined to buy new cheap things for the whole family, and though they might not be so fine as the uselessly resplendent piece of wearing apparel, they would represent a gift rather than a riddance on her part. For weeks before Christmas, she spent long evenings over the catalog, never alone, but with Pete and Rye when gifts for the elder cows were in question, and with Corey while Sears Ro Roebuck was being thumbed in an effort to find suitable presents for the children. None of the household, with the possible exception of Chris, had ever before given or received a Christmas gift. Their ideals of appropriate gifts were a continual revelation to Louisa. Brought up as she was with the thoughts that prettiness and uniqueness in Christmas presents were more desirable qualities than usefulness. Rye and Pete were the first to steer her away from such crazy notions. She had suggested silk hose for their mother, but Rye, her mouth full of last popcorn, looked at the length of sheer hose enticingly displayed in bright pink on the catalog's page and shook her head. Mom would tear them things a running up and down through the brush in no time at all, she said. Get cottons. Louisa hesitated and looked at her own cotton hose with ill-concealed distaste. They were of all the unpleasant features of teaching in Cow Valley, the most irksome. She hated cotton stockings and could not bring herself to give another a thing she so detested. She suggested some dainty silk step-ins, but Rye insisted on good heavy underwear, or better still, just the material so that her mother might make them herself and they would be certain to fit. 
They finally compromised on bright woolen gloves and a scarf for Corey, though Rye was a bit dubious about the scarf. Her mother had always got along without one and might not wear such a thing now, she feared. Presents for the men caused less discussion, though their selection was affected only after a number of evenings of page thumbings and long conferences as to their likes and dislikes. Pete was all for buying Lee Buck a box of shotgun shells and cartridges for Chris's Big Smith Wesson, but Teacher and Rye overpowered him almost completely. Lee Buck received socks and a necktie with a box of cartridges for the 22 rifle that Pete used. Handkerchiefs and a tie were selected for Chris in spite of Rye's suggestion that Teacher give him underwear. A few busy days before, she had heard him remark that he must buy some winter underwear and now reason that teacher might get him some and save an expenditure on his part. The whole family assisted in the selection of Beetle's presents. Louisa bought her various inexpensive playthings, but not a doll. Beetle had already shown with the thoroughness so evident in her nature her complete disinterest in one, might almost say contempt for dolls. Beetle would have none of the sock doll she had made for her, refusing at first to touch it and later showing an apathy toward it, not to be compared with the interest and consolation she got from Louisa's slippers, the claw hammer, or the rusty skeleton of a horse pistol. After several evenings, the order was complete to a bucket of hard candy for the school and six red tissue paper bells. These were the only decorations Louisa could buy, and her heart bled a little thinking of all the tinsel and gilt and glass wasted in Lexington and elsewhere. In the end, however, she was glad that she had spent so little. She wanted to give these people something they might have in their homes when she was gone and forgotten. A Christmas, as she planned it, cost next to nothing and lay within the means of the poorest. Before Louisa came, the children had never decorated the schoolroom for Christmas or anything else, but this year the decorating began not long after Teacher and Chris helped Samantha T. get the wild cat. Noon hours and periods not exactly belonging to that elastic term were used in gathering evergreens. The prettiest hollies of all grew in the old cow graveyard on the other side of the hill near Pomp's store. Two trees, thick as a boy's waist, raised their blood-red berries above the soil of old Andy Cow's grave, dead these 100 years or more. Louisa never tired of looking at the graves, all old and neglected, mostly forgotten, with many of their roughly cut stone slabs fallen on their faces. One thing about the half-illegible births and deaths carved on the stones appealed to her with poignant significance. It was the large number of dead babies and young wives. Among the dead were a great many more old men than old women. The women, it seemed, died often in their thirties and forties, and she could understand why this was so. Corey was only 32, yet she had borne six children and appeared to be in her late forties. The graves, Louisa knew, told not only of the past, but of the now. Babies still died, and women grew old and died before their time in years was ended. Thinking such thoughts while the children flitted about in and under the holly trees, taking care to speak softly and little while among the dead, she would be a little frightened by the stark vistas such thoughts led her into. These people with their dying babies and old young women needed her. She might in time do much for them, better them without trying to change the ancient patterns of their lives. She would play with the ideal of living here, studying the rudiments of nursing, teaching them in music, in poetry, in handicrafts, in the things they were most interested, building Cave Creek School into a model school with toilets and a library and cloakrooms. At times the thought that she had done so little overwhelmed her with an inexpressible feeling of something worse than failure. Not failure because she had not even tried. She had been content to watch them, learn from them, instead of their learning from her. She had taught them a few things in books, a few stories, a few songs, given them scrambled glimpses of the outside world, and that was about all. Yet all said that she was the best teacher they had ever had. That was the pity of it. She ought to stay. For the first time in her life, perhaps, she saw herself with absolute candor, and the sight was not an inspiring one. 
Always, though, never an egotist, she had owned her share of pride in her mind that she knew to be better than average. In her body, which was strong and sound and not unbeautiful, her family, its traditions, and culture. Now with the same eye that she saw the tragedy of the gravestones, she saw herself. She was not an individual, but one of a pattern, like the cheap silk dresses sold in department store basements, differing perhaps in minor details, but in their quality and origin essentially the same. She was what she was through, no act or thought on her part, but solely as a result of that combination of circumstances that had constituted her environment. Seeing herself so, she wanted to wreck the mold of her universe and make of herself a person, an individual with a place in the world of her choosing, not to continue as the docile product and tool of some mechanism of education. She could do that by staying here, marrying maybe, what would it be like living with Chris? Could she make him love her until he forgot to hate and learn to forget? Then, frightened by the realization that she almost wanted to try to do such things, she would quickly think of other matters or speak to the children, telling them it was time to go. They would leave, walking silently for a time, troubled by the sad perplexity of teacher's face and thoughts of the old dead left back there under the holly trees. Other days, they went to certain ridges where the mistletoe was grown, known to grow in the bare branches of oak and black gum trees. Though the children knew next to nothing of Santa Claus and all the modern paraphernalia of Christmas, they attached a special significance to the holly and the mistletoe. Why, they did not know. Corey and Sally had long been in the habit of bringing these evergreens into the house at Christmas time. Some of the children knew that the holly tree had once been a thorn bush, and because it had made thorns for Christ's head, was forever condemned to stand all winter in the cold, shedding blood and holding its leaves to the snow and cold without folding them away in buds as did the other trees. They gathered cedar too, and often on the ridge sides they found winter grain, the leaves of which were good for tea and the berries better than any candy, so the teacher said, but by some wordless agreement they never ate any, but gave the small red bits of spiciness to teacher. Though she cared little for them, she would take and eat all they gave her, and the children would be pleased because they had given something to teacher. Then one day, teacher declared it time to hunt the Christmas tree, and never was there such walking about and consultation and anxious measuring as went on that noon hour. The ridge behind the schoolhouse was full of pines of every size, but because of that, most likely, the children were determined to have a round green cedar so that all the school must walk to the Hayes cow pasture where the roundest and greenest cedars grow. They found one to their liking and came by Lee Buck Corey's carrying it in proud procession. Corey saw them and immediately ran to the gate and made them all come inside and warm by the fire. It was hog killing day at Lee Buck's, and Corey gave each child a piece of the still warm melt so that all, they all sat about the fire, broiling meat and licking their fingers while driving the raw December cold from their bones. Lee Buck came in, proud to have the school at his house, and admired the tree, and took hammer and saw and nails, and went with them to see that it was put firmly to the floor. By that hour, there was hardly time for language geography, so that the decorating of the tree must be postponed until the next day. They had for some time been saving the tin full that came from certain brands of chewing tobacco, and now each child had enough to cover a small cardboard star teacher had made. There were many strings of popcorn and small bunches of the bright bitter dogwood berries brought by the Brander Seuss Meese children. Louisa one night expressed to Corey the wish that she had brought some candles for the tree. Corey looked thoughtful but said nothing, only looked into the fire, folding and refolding her hands and arms in her feed sack apron, a habit of hers when in thought. The next afternoon, Rye and Pete seemed unduly anxious to get home, rushing teacher along through the rain so that she was hard put to keep her breath. At the back porch steps, Rye could contain herself no longer. 
Mom's got a surprise for you, she said, dashing across the porch into the kitchen and being immediately shooed out again by Corey, who demanded that she be civilized and wipe her feet. The odor of hot tallow grease was heavy in the damp air, and Louisa wondered if the men were greasing their cowhides. Rye would not give her time to go into the big house, but pulled her wet coat and all into the kitchen to show her the surprise, candles for the Christmas tree. Corey was making them a dozen slender tallow candles. Her method was simple, probably differing little from the manner in which her grandmother had made them. She had a kettle of hot tallow, not boiling, but only warm enough to be liquid, a small board with a dozen nails tacked to it, and twelve well-lubed twisted strands of twine six inches or more long. These she dipped one at a time into the kettle of warm tallow, taking care not to tallow the top of the loop by which she hung the candle to a nail on the board she held. While the other candles were being dipped, the first one dipped, hardened, and was then ready for another coating of the smelly grease. Rye's delight was beyond words, but Teacher, while glad of the candles, felt the foolish lump in her throat that often came when some one of these poor people did something for her. Where did you get the tallow, Corey? she asked after admiring the candles. Becky, Becky Mounts' son-in-law killed a beef, and I went and swapped me a hog's liver for the tallow. Louisa said nothing. It would be foolish to say, Corey, it is four miles over there and four miles back, which means that you have walked or ridden a mule eight miles in the rain so that we might have candles for the Christmas tree. Among all the people I know, there is not one who would go eight miles in the rain to give me a little thing I wanted. She thought, however, and the thoughts far from giving her pleasure saddened her. She had that same day been telling the children of her first Christmas in boarding school. It had been a dreary, lonesome time, for even at that early age she had not been too sophisticated to draw any childish feelings of happiness from a boisterous Santa Claus and an over-decorated Christmas tree. She remembered that she had cried herself to sleep Christmas night from loneliness and tiredness, but it was not of such things that she spoke to the children. To her tales of a Santa Claus, a tall tree glittering with electric lights and store-bought ornaments, they listened with shining eyes in which belief in the incredible mingled with doubt. Rye had been captivated by teacher's description of the tall red candles that burned in the windows and right on the table where we ate. Now as she watched her mother painstakingly dip the coarse yellow candles, she doubtless was not seeing ugly, lumpy things of grease, but the slender red tapers of teacher's story. For after a time, she said, Mom, let me go to Pomps for whiskey killers. Whiskey killers was the local name for the bright red cinnamon drops sold in the hill stores near Christmas time. Corey said nothing but looked inquiringly at her child. For to make the candles red? Rye said, put them in the towel and make the red come off. Run ahead, Corey said. Get a nickel out in the pitcher in the cupboard. Rye, with Pete at her heels, made the mile run to Pomps and back in record time, returning wet, muddy, and breathless with visions of tall red candles shining in her eyes. Her scheme worked with fair success, and though the candles were not the rich crimson of the ones in Teacher's story, but a yellow streaky red, all declared them beautiful and never tired of admiring them. The next day, Louisa fastened them to the tree with baling wire and hairpins, and the children could hardly wait until time to light them. Lee Buck, Hayes, and Rans Dykes had been persuaded by the children to buy three bars each of the ten full wrapped tobacco they used so that there might be ten full for tinsel for the tree. Teacher had told the children of the way people in Lexington decorated their trees with imitation icicles, and they wishing to do as the people in Lexington did, cut the ill-smelling tobacco wrappings into narrow strips and hung them carefully about the tree. Then Mabel and Rye, at the latter's suggestion, went one snowy morning to the Hayes Cow pasture where last summer the milkweed had grown. On the gray leafless stalks, a few of the pods still clung, but half opened their feathery winged seeds wet with snow. These the girls gathered and took back to the school and laid them under and about the stove until they might dry. 
When dry, they were opened and the shining down of the seed wings scattered over the tree. True, they floated all about the room and caused not a little merriment among the children who caught at them, laughing and trying to throw the bright weightless things through the air. But a goodly share of them clung to the tree where they had made a soft glittering among the red dogwood berries and strings of popcorn. Everywhere there was whispering and plotting and scheming of the present for the one whose name had been drawn and for teacher. No one had any money to spend unless it be a nickel or so, but all the same there were presents. Mabel was working on an ABC book made with flour sack twine and wrapping paper for her baby brother. Rye, who was fairly skillful with her needle, was making tobacco sack pin cushions for half the ladies of the valley, and so in four together for bags to hold the marbles teacher had given some of the boys. Lander and Clyde Meese whittled bright red cedar wood and held the object of their whittling a close secret. The days passed until the Friday before Christmas came, and though the house was full of holly and pine and mistletoe, teacher said that they would all go again to the cow graveyard and gather more holly so that it would be green and fresh when Christmas came next week. Louisa still thought of Samantha T. She might come to the holly trees expecting teacher in the school and go away disappointed. The holly gathering would most likely be the only Christmas the girl would have. Maybe Samantha T. would climb the holly trees and laugh and throw the branches down and forget to speak of trouble from the other end. And maybe now that it was Christmas time, Rye and the other children would be kinder to the girl and invite her to the Christmas tree. Such were the teacher's thoughts as she walked with her children up and around to the holly trees in the graveyard, but all her warm little Christmas hopes left her when once they were near the holly trees and she saw Samantha T. standing motionless, half hidden among a clump of myrtle-shrouded cedars. She knew then that Samantha T. would not laugh and that she had not come to gather evergreens. She glanced at her children and knew that they would have nothing to do with her, for they stared at the girl, their faces veiled with careful disconcern, colder and farther from friendliness than hot hatred would have been. Rye looked first at her, then at Louisa. Howdy, Samantha T., she said. Howdy, Rye. Teacher, Rye said, taking Pete by the hand. Mom asked me to get to get her some, some sody if Williams was close to Pomp's store. We'll go now and then get the holly. But Samantha T. wants, Louisa began. I just dropped by, teacher, Samantha T. said, and apparently as anxious to be rid of the children as they were to get away from her, and waited in silence until they were gone. Teacher, she then said without looking at Louisa, you'd never listen to me, and Mrs. Goshen, I told you once she was a wanting to talk to you. Well, she's down yander at the fence corner a waiting. Louisa stiffened. Samantha T., I won't mix in all this gossip. It ain't gossip, teacher. Mrs. Gosson, she's come a long way in the cold, and she's a-standin' just by the fence. She turned toward the fence, and Louisa followed her through the cedar trees and leaned on the snow-covered rails and wondered whether pity or curiosity impelled her to do this. Samantha T. called softly into the trees on the other side of the fence. It's all right, Mrs. Gosson. Nobody here now but the teacher. Louisa waited, chafing her hands to keep them warm. She would have complained that she did not want to stand and wait and that her hands ached with the cold, but was ashamed. Samantha T. stood motionless, unaware that snow sifted onto her hair or that her bare chapped hands and legs were numb and blue. Her dark eyes were eager but troubled, as if she both wanted and feared the meeting of the two women. I hope you didn't get mad, teacher, she said when footsteps crackled over the dead frozen leaves. Louisa did not answer her. She saw the woman from the other end and wished immediately that she were away in another world if need be, where her mind might be free of Samantha T's troubled eyes and Chris's rigid face and now this woman that she thought she must see in her mind's eye forever after. 
She did not look to be a living creature made of good warm flesh and blood, but rather to Louisa a ghost-like personification of all that was bleak and cold and pitiful in the hills. A hard anger and hatred was written onto her face, but an anger without warmth or passion as if it had long ago consumed all that the soul behind the face had to give and lived only because there was nothing else in the woman to live. She came to the fence without speaking while her eyes searched Louise's face with a kind of hope, the girl thought, as if they might find some precious thing there. "'Ye look awful young to be a teaching," she said. The voice startled her. It was so different from the dead face it came from. It was warm and holding something of the same ringing, music as Corey's voice, but softer and older and subdued. I'm not so young, she answered, and for the first time looked straight into the woman's eyes. They were a vivid blue, but sunken under heavy black brows. The eyes in their brows seemed out of place in the face, for the woman's hair was white and her skin gray like wet ashes. I hope you won't think it choir that I be a wanting to talk with you, the woman said. I'd like to talk with anyone, Louisa answered. You don't mean that. Nobody from down your way is wanting to talk with anybody from mine. But thinking as how you're not really mixed up in it, I took the chance. Louisa felt taken with a vast weariness and a greater fear. She did not want to know the things this woman knew or be called upon to have the emotions she must have once had. She wanted to get away and forget her. She could help no one by listening to her story, be it a warning of what she thought must happen or a long recital of things past. The de dead were dead. Chris and Lee Buck and those she knew were still alive and that was enough. Of course I'm glad to meet you and know you. You must come visit me at school sometime. It's almost over now. I suppose you're gathering evergreens for Christmas. I think I had better be going. I want to overtake the children. Her words, she thought, sounded silly, disconnected like a child's. She could not think with this woman watching her. You'd best listen to her, Samantha T. said. I don't want to hear anything about what has happened. I'm a stranger here, she added, feeling that she lied. Chris and Corey and Lee Buck no longer thought of her as a stranger. You think as much of Chris as one human being thinks of another, the woman asked. Louisa flushed. Yes, I like Chris. You wouldn't want to see him took or killed? No, but how could I help by talking to you? She thought the woman flinched a little. I don't mean that I dislike you, but you see, I live with the others. I like them. I couldn't do anything they oughtn't to know about. I like them too, the woman said, her voice so low, Louisa thought she hadn't heard right until she added in a louder tone. I'd tell Corey if I could. It's about Chris. My man had... Please, Louisa said. I know too much already. I couldn't help you. I couldn't even tell them I had talked to you. She turned and took a step away. The woman's voice, louder, now followed her. You're afeard, afeard of them, and afeard of me and mine, and afeard of the law for Chris. Louisa turned on her. I am afraid. Why shouldn't I be? Why should you want to help me when... I know, mine killed Thurn and Thurn killed mine, she whispered and stared past Louisa toward the gravestones. There's so many there, teacher, that's been put here by trouble. Not just the bullets and the men, it's took the women too. And the way they went was harder, so slow. I get tired sometimes of thinking. I see you won't listen, not now. I never will. Chris is safe here down in this valley with all the cows. He has done nothing to the Barnetts. Lee Buck has. The one under that white headstone yander hadn't done nothing either. Just kin of Lee Buck's. He never harmed a living soul. She turned back into the trees. Come on, Samantha T., some other time. You're a doing wrong, teacher, Samantha T. said and climbed slowly over the fence and followed the woman away. When they had gone, Louisa went to the white headstone and on it traced the words, David Thomas Calhoun, and saw that when he died, he would have been 20 years old could he, he have lived a month longer. Chris was 24 or 5, but he liked to live so. Maybe the other one had loved his life too. 
She walked away quickly and once in the road ran. The woman in the graves and Samantha T's eyes filled her with a terror of living, of being afraid, of death, of sorrow, so that it gripped her as she ran over the snowy ground, hardly knowing she ran, and could only say to the children when she met them returning from pomps, I was cold and I ran. It was Rye who remembered first that they had gathered no holly. We have enough anyway, Louisa said, somehow loath to go to the holly trees again. In the face of all this other, Christmas seemed so far away and unreal and somehow pitiful. Mm. What a chapter. Started out with all that wonderful Christmas joy and then ended on such a sad note, such a sad, scary note. I really love all the parts at the beginning of the chapter when they're talking about, uh, Louise is talking about all the Christmas decorating that they're doing. They're out hunting the holly and the mistletoe. I really love that part. And I find it interesting where she says they didn't, um, there in Cal Valley, they didn't really do anything at Christmas, so she's teaching them all those things. But then she goes on to say that for some reason, Sally and Corey always did gather greenery that time of the year, so... And she's kind of saying that they didn't even know why, but still, so that was like a celebration, even though Louisa didn't quite understand that. There had to be a reason that they chose that time of the year to decorate with greenery. So I, I love that picture. I like the part with them picking out the gifts. Um, I could really relate with Rye because I'm somebody that likes practical gifts. I'm that person that really wants it to be something useful. Uh, so that's the kind of gifts that my family buys for me. They've learned over the years. I will pick practical and useful over pretty or unique all day long just because I like useful things so I especially like that part and then the wonderful gift that Corey made for teacher you know she she went those four miles there and four miles back in the rain to get the taller she was calling it the tallow and made those candles just because teacher said she wished she had them that's so precious isn't that so precious that she did that just out of the kindness of her heart um, you can tell that the family is really loving teacher as much as teacher is loving them. So I, I enjoyed that part. That's my, that just had to make Louisa feel uh, so happy. But then she says it made her sad. So that's a, that's a unique peek into Louisa. How could it make her happy? But I mean, it pleased her, but at the same time, it made her sad. I don't know if that's because she thought that... Um, if, because somehow she's still kind of looking down on the cows, even though she's lived with them and she likes them. She's looking down on their poverty. Um, but for me, I mean, there's just different avenues of poverty. I mean, different ways to look at it. Like a lot of people would consider my family poor, but I don't think we're poor. And you'll often hear that, like I've heard lots of people say, even in my family, like when the Great Depression back in those days, they might say, well, in my family, we didn't know any different because we just kept doing what we were doing. That's kind of how we were. So it didn't really affect us because they weren't used to having cash money. So they were still just used to making do with what they had. And uh, I think in the same way, Corey, she just did that to please teacher because she wanted to make her happy. Um, but maybe Louisa looked at it like she went so far out of her way and, and, you know, she sent the gift to Louisa's aunt and all that and that she just shouldn't have because she's so, um, you know, poor. But Corey would have looked at it. She looked at it like, no, this is like a great service. This makes me happy. I'm sure it brought her great joy and she didn't expect anything in return. So I really like that little peek into it, into Corey, but also into Louisa that she's still just not able to understand that the cows are happy with their life, even though it's different, so different from the one she left. The cows are really pleased, or the cows are really pleased with the life that they live. And then even that rye, she's so creative, even with the candles that she thought to get the cinnamon. I guess that's like the cinnamon hots that uh, people sometimes, they are more popular around Christmas, but some people even flavor their apple butter with them because of that cinnamon. So rye, though, she thought of that so that they could make the candles have some color. So rye's always creative. Remember the big globe that she uh, made the stove into a globe. That was her, her ideal there that she had. Um, and it, all that goodness, happiness led us all the way up to then the part, the sad part of the uh, cemetery there of the graveyard. Um, it almost seems like, because there's that woman from the other end that kind of wants to, she, they want to warn them, but then like she says, I would tell Corey, 
And then if you remember back several chapters, there was like Corey knew a little bit about Samantha Teeth. So it's kind of like there is some good will there, but it's just covered up by all the other bad stuff. It's almost like if you could get them all together and talk it out, it'd probably be all right. But I don't think that's probably not what's going to happen um, in this book. And uh, But I wish it would. But we'll just have to keep reading. So I hope that you'll leave a comment and let me know what parts of this chapter that you liked. I'm sure, like me, you loved all those Christmas preparations that she was talking about. Um, but then it end, left us on a real downer there at the end with the graveyard. But be sure to leave a comment and let me know what jumped out at you. And as always, I hope you'll continue to drop back by because we got to find out what happens next in Mountain Path.